However, Dwayne has been gracious enough to allow me to do uh, pretty much uh, have free reign on the property to accomplish what needs to be accomplished uh, in order to really find out uh, or as close to as possible so far, find out what's going on. So let's start out that way. Okay, so we're gonna head into Blind Frog Ranch. Past the gates are actually the BLM, it's the Bureau of Land Management, uh, their land. You have to traverse approximately one mile uh, in a southeast direction to get over to Blind Frog Ranch. And let me tell you, if you have a car, I drive a, a very uh, low profile Acura, it stops right there. It can go no farther. And if I'm not with Dwayne, I'm hiking in, which is a good mile hike. And it's pretty rugged over a pretty large stream called Mosby, well, it's Creek, Mosby Creek, uh, before you can get over to the property. So that house in the background is actually the neighbor's home, just an FYI for you all. See, nobody knows that. Now you do. So this pool of water leads to the flooded underground cavities that Dwayne was talking about. Uh, you've also seen it quite a bit on Mystery at Blind Frog Ranch. The pool obviously was created by uh, Dwayne's digging. So I wanted to talk about something. Remember that the Spaniards came into the area in the 1500s. It wasn't 1776 like the historians want you to believe with the Escalante expedition. And we're told by the Native American population of mines that were already dug, mined with yellow rocks known to the indigenous people. Yellow rocks that the Spaniards seemed to covet. This was followed by the Mexicans, then the Mormons arriving in the mid 1800s and they were told by a chief Wakara of the Timpanagos tribe of Shoshone about mines and gold that were already known, even already smelted into bullion. So who was originally mining in the area using the local indigenous population as slave labor, even before the Spaniards were there? So that leads into an entirely different presentation I have on the giants and the desert archaic Indians that became the Aztec nation later. Uh, that would take another three hours to get through. So nobody ever goes over the technology that they use when they're doing uh, on the field and uh, on the ground investigation. And I thought this was pretty important because I could sit up here and I could tell you numbers and talk about stuff. You see it on a lot of paranormal shows. They're like, oh my God, it went up to 117. And everybody you know, that's watching is like, oh my God, it went up to 117. That's amazing. Well, what went up to 117? What does that mean? So let's, let's talk about some of this. On the left is a Stalker ATR stationary KA band radar gun. It operates in the microwave range of 34.7 gigahertz. Now remember that microwave frequency is electromagnetic radiation. The waves of uh, electrical and magnetic energy are moving together through space. This is the same type of device that I used to use catching people speeding when I was a police officer. <laughs> so I am very good at using this. And don't hate me, I wasn't a police officer here, so if you got a citation in this area, no, it was in California, in Texas. On the left is a new piece of technology that uh, I got to use last year, and this thing is just unbelievable. I feel like I'm cheating most of the time. It's a GER, a G-E-R 3D ground imaging system. It's a magnetometer that's readings, are reading the magnetic field uh, strength that is converted for depth and type of object or void and size of the object. It issues a coordinated color scheme through imaging software. It shows what is below ground as deep as 18 meters, which is almost 60 feet below ground, depending on ground type and soil type. Uh, it provides 2D and 3D data points, which I am going to show you some of that later in this presentation. Now, on the left, uh, this is what I used on Secret of Skinwalker Ranch if you watched uh, season two. This is an Alpha Labs EM2 vector, 
vector magnetometer. It measures the magnetic field at a specific spot on the planet. It also shows direction of the field. Those measurements are provided in what is known as micro Tesla. In the center, you see a white TM808 deep penetrating metal detection unit. It can go down as deep as 10 to 18 feet below ground using two detection coils. And it's uh, pretty big, it's about three and a half feet long. On the left is a Model 600C power cable locator. This is an amazing tool to locate atypical energy readings. It does a better job than the handheld devices that you're seeing on television. Uh, uh, in the other one, I believe, the other show, it's a trifeld meter that you'll see them holding. This one pinpoints exactly where it's coming from. And then just quickly, the magnetic field is a vector field that describes the magnetic influence on moving electric charges, electric currents, and magnetic material. Um, so the positive thing about using a vector magnetometer is it shows direction, which really helps because then you know where these magnetic anomalies are occurring or what direction they're occurring from. Now some of my other gadgets are, and you know what? Little pointer here. So right here is my brand new thermal imaging. Um, what that allows uh, for me to do is to be able to see in a different light spectrum. So it picks up heat, heat signatures. And if you've noticed recently in a lot of shows, it seems like a lot of what is occurring and I sometimes hate using this, but maybe interdimensionally or elsewhere is only being picked up in being able to see through a different radiation. You know, our eyes are only capable of seeing so many different colors. And this goes well past what we're capable of seeing. In the middle is my analog compass. I carry that, I guess, like I would carry a Bible to church because when that thing has started spinning, something's been wrong. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it spins clockwise, counterclockwise. Usually there's something else that follows that. So it's just a great tool to have all the time. Uh, the middle is a do uh, dosimeter, which uh, measures ionizing radiation. Uh, very important on Skinwalker Ranch spe uh, specifically to have that. Then I have a GPS next to that, and then I have a, another um, spectrum analyzer, which is like the Trifeld meter. I kind of prefer this one right there, the EMF 390. Uh, it collects data. Uh, when you use the Trifeld, it only tells you uh, RF, radio frequency, EF, electric field, or EMF, the electromagnetic field, one at a time. This tells you all three at the same time. It tells you direction and it also collects all that data and then you can analyze it uh, immediately. And you can even, it has several different graphing systems. Now th this one I started using because of Duane's property. It's a electrical activity uh, collector. It's, a, it's basically used to let you know when there's electrical lightning strikes taking place in or around you. And what's good for that is because it also picks up uh, EF and EMF uh, anomalies or unexplainable occurrences. So you know if that's something starting to take place when that starts going off. I think it goes as far out as 12 miles. What scares me is when it's within a mile or less. That's when you kind of got to start panicking or finding out running, something like that. Now, the terrain at Blind Frog Ranch is extremely difficult to use much of the equipment that we have. And that's because, look at it, it's rugged, mountainous wilderness. This is Duane's property. So imagine having to search for an ancient cultural site or mine in this type of terrain. Even with being able to see underground, it's still comparable to finding a needle in a mountainous haystack. And it's obviously not easy to get around the property with all that equipment in tow, so I'm lucky I have Dwayne with his tank to help me get around. And sometimes it can be a bit sketchy, so 
You know, it was easy getting up to where I was in this. I didn't realize I was about 50 feet down, and it was like straight down. And it took me about 10 minutes in that position to figure out if I was going to start yelling for somebody to call a helicopter to save me. But no, I was too embarrassed, so I just it took about 40 minutes to get down what only took five minutes to get up. But I'm here. Then you often pick up interesting readings using certain equipment, but trace it coming from places like this on the property. So how the hell do you access sites with natural barriers like this? It can only be done with heavy machinery, which is costly and time consuming. It takes a very long time to get the heavy equipment out to Blind Frog Ranch. So you've seen uh, Dwayne in a couple of those big backhoes or uh, the drill equipment that comes out on the ranch. And it, on the show, it takes 12, 15 seconds, and then it's there and they're doing it. That sucker takes several hours sometimes to get out to where they're drilling or where they're digging. Uh, and, and sometimes I'm just amazed at how Dwayne's even capable of driving it off of these narrow ledges. He's crazy sometimes, but that's what, I'll, I'll leave that to him and I'll, I'll use the smaller tech. So this is an indigenous people's occupation site for centuries. We have pulled out artifacts as far back as the archaic period, which is 2,000 plus years or older. Now, I personally believe there's a cave entrance deeper down, and that is why this spot has been occupied for thousands of years. Over the centuries, the entrance eventually was covered up. It continued to be used as a gathering site for exchange, crafting, and cooking based upon the artifact finds and the amount of ash and charcoal remains. Now, there are many, many bones that have been pulled out of this site. And so far, I don't think any of them are human. I'm hoping they're not human. So I put a bunch of them over on the right for you to see over here. This was our collection in about 30 minutes, what we pulled out, 30 minutes. Now I want to give a little bit of credit and kudos to this individual that's taller and bigger than Dwayne, if you can believe it. This is Chris Bartell. Now you may know or have heard, who here has heard of Bass, Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Studies, right? Bob Bigelow. He owned Skinwalker Ranch before Brandon Fugel did. Chris was part of Bass for six plus years he was on Skinwalker Ranch. This individual knows more about Skinwalker Ranch than anybody current or in the past. He spent the most time there. Uh, amazing individual and uh, just a, a wealth of knowledge in helping both Dwayne and I with what we're trying to accomplish. This is another angle of that cultural site. So just real quickly, right in here is about three feet for being able to stand up. This is the pit. And you see the ash come out about, probably about another eight to 10 feet. Uh, Dwayne was talking about these mesh uh, tables where they do the beads. The beads are found in here along with a lot of other stuff. That is where I believe the cave is, is all the way at the bottom. That's why I think, I think the cultural site started out that way as a cave and then it just built up over time. Now, the top is that archaic period arrowhead uh, that Chris actually pulled out. And you can see that up there. It's 2,000 plus years old. Then there's a scraper below it. Uh, my degrees are in anthropology and archaeology, so I've been out in the field quite a bit. Most of my work was done in Mesoamerica, which is in Mexico and Central America, mostly in the Yucatan. Um, so only for about the last seven or eight years I've been working in the desert southwest because of the connections that I've personally found with Mesoamerica. And we're going to go into that right now, which is it's amazing. But so the scraper is probably about two to three hundred years old. Now, more findings from this occupation site. These were located by Sid Riker over the course of several years. 
Most of the small beads are trade beads that were imported, and this is nuts, from Venice, Italy. Isn't that crazy? An Italian connection with the middle of nowhere. It's unreal. So what they were, they were being traded with the Native Americans in the 19th century. Now we found the information, Sid found the information from the bead maker himself. Uh, he created the beige beads and he died, I believe, in 1894 and never passed that on. So they were never made after that. And then some other interesting uh, arrowheads and additional larger beads, turquoise beads. So Duane was talking about several energy, energy zones. There's one, two, three of them that I know of. There may have, may be more that maybe we'll find out about on this season. So I have personally had a crap ton of equipment failures occurring. The first time I went up there with Duane, he was like, I said, really, you know, this is, I don't know. He was like, ah, you wait and see. And I didn't have anything at first. And I was like, well, I knew, you know, what are you talking about? None of this. Two minutes later, equipment started failing. So what you're seeing on the left was that very first time that I was up there with Dwayne and Chad. This was uh, well before uh, any filming was ever done, uh, before season one was ever done of Mystery at Blind Frog Ranch. And what was occurring here was that's a spectrum analyzer on the left and my GPS working perfectly. We walk into this energy zone and sure enough, everything blanked out. So I started photographing it so that everybody could see. The GPS, which is obviously line of sight, uses a light radio wave between the ground and the satellites above the Earth. It works, it, especially out in the middle of nowhere, but at this spot, it could not track any of the satellites. So I just wanted everybody to be able to see this occurring. Now this summer, my spectrum analyzer at this other energy site, well, it's, it was working. Uh, this time around, I was getting high voltage spike readings in only the electric field which is bizarre. It was transitioning from nine volts per meter to 94 volts per meter. Uh, that's a, that means that my RF, my radio frequency, and EMF, my electromagnetic frequency was zero. There was nothing. That's extremely rare to have EF without the EMF because that's ruling out that this unexplainable transient occurrence had nothing to do with uh, magnetism, nothing magnetic, no magnetite. And who, for those of you that have been out on the property, it's in the middle of nowhere. There are no electrical poles anywhere near it. Um, I didn't have a cellular phone. I do not carry cellular phone when I'm doing, um, taking readings, data points, because it'll corrupt the data. I don't allow anyone to get around me because they'll corrupt the data. And yet I was getting this transient movement all the way up to 94 volts per meter. So remember, too, that Blind Frog Ranch is 21 miles northeast of Skinwalker Ranch. So this energy effect and these other anomalous occurrences are not just on the two ranches themselves. We're talking about the Uinta Basin and the Uinta Mountains. So here we are, we're doing some 3D ground imaging with uh, Duane above the underground caverns. Here we're using the 3D ground imager at a location uh, that prior to this had another piece of equipment coming back with the potential to have a high yield of gold. Now, am I, am I allowed to tell them just how high? Is that okay? So I gotta tell this story. I use this other technology to find gold here in the Superstition Mountains. Uh, it's a hobby, and it's, it makes a lot of money as a hobby. And when I go out there, I look for an ounce, sometimes two ounces, and I set this system. Maybe the most that I've ever looked for was maybe six to eight ounces. I'm trying to find a, a placer mined uh, at the bottom of a creek bed, 
um, or a load claim would be a little higher. That means it would have to be mined out if it were a load claim. So I asked Dwayne and Chad, I go, well, what do you want me to look for? Pound, two pounds, gold? Because we're looking for something that's already been smelted. It's gold bullion already. And he goes, well, how high does that damn machine of yours go? And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, damn, what does it peg out at? I think that was what he said. And I said, well, it'll go to 100 plus pounds, but I've never used that. He goes, well, turn that crap up. So for the next three hours, we followed a signal that led to this location for 100 plus pounds of gold. Now, unfortunately, the machine doesn't tell me if that's raw ore or been smelted already. But that machine has never, ever been wrong, at least not so far. So we're standing over something there that's equivalent to over 100 pounds of gold. Now I've told Dwayne, I didn't get a chance to physically show him this location. It looks like a dry, collapsed cavity entrance on the property. After all, on Blind Frog Ranch, we're searching for the possibility of three different underground locations. One is a standard gold mine, where ore is located, needs removal, and processing. Second, a location that would have cached, that's C-A-C-H-E-D, cached gold bullion that was just waiting to be sent back down to Santa Fe and then Mexico City by the Spaniards. This may have later been considered the Sacred Mine or the Rhodes Mine, Brigham Young Mine, or the Mormon Mine. And then third, and I've talked to Duane about this, and it's what I'm looking for as an avocational archaeologist and anthropologist. It's the most important site on the planet, or at least what I consider. It's called Kershanab. It's home of the ancient ancestors, storage site of historical data that could show us our ancient missing past, Potential location of Aztec riches brought back to be protected by their distant cousins, the Timpanogos tribe of the Shoshone. And, and that's where I want to stop for a moment. Now, a lot of people are confused. I was confused until a couple months ago. I thought that everything that was we were dealing with up there was Ute Indians, the Ute. We're all wrong. It's the Utah Territory Indians that we're dealing with, which were not Ute. The Ute were in Colorado and New Mexico. So I had to throw everything out, apologize to people, put it on my YouTube, I got it wrong, but I wanna get the new information out there. We're talking about the Utah Territory Indians, which were the Shoshone, specifically in this location, the Timpanogos tribe, the Snake Band, and then the other ones were the Paiute. So this is something that we have to start changing. So these are the three different things that we're looking for in there. Now obviously there is no way, I mean Chris is a huge dude, but I don't think he can move that, uh, that one stone down there that probably weighs about 800 pounds. So it's gonna require heavy machinery to move the debris. This is at uh, the northern tip of the property. If it is a dry entrance to an underground cavity system, um, remember Dwayne's talking about just under two miles of cavern system. So there's got to be a dry side entrance somewhere. I have a feeling that this is a good potential spot for that. So you ready to go in it with me? All right. And of course, there's some good sized cavity entrances, some of them having unnatural markers pointing to their location. Many of the entrances are small, but once inside, they open to a larger cave, cavern, or rock shelter. These are not natural formations, they're man made markers. The one on the left is pointing towards a cave that is yet to be explored. The one on the right is pointing to where much of Duane's digging is taking place, the pond location. I took a photo of this one. This is actually, my new book comes out in March. It's called The Giant and the Golden Underworld. I think that gives it away, right, where it's gonna take place. I actually use this in my book. Um, this is a man-made marker located on Blind Frog Ranch. It led us to a cave entrance that's gonna be further explored. June's okay? In June. 
Now this is just barely north of Blind Frog Ranch, first time that I have ever been inside an ice cave. Ladies and gentlemen, you're talking about desert with ice caves underground. Is that not amazing? So remember that Blind Frog Ranch has approximately two miles of known underground cavern systems inundated with water. Look at these locations, all known to be or have underground voids, cavities, or caverns. Many are with water running through them. So I continue to float the hypothesis that the phenomena taking place on the Uinta Basin is due to what is below ground. Phenomena is created by the energy below, or it's attracted to what energy is below ground. So real quick, right up here you have Pole Creek Caverns. Dark Canyon, interesting story. The Yenald Lushi, the Skinwalkers, Skinwalker Ranch. The Skinwalkers don't live on the ranch or up on the Mesa. The Ute and the Shoshone, guess where they say the Skinwalkers are? Dark Canyon, right along this cavern system. Mosby Mountain, that's where the ice cave is. Blind Frog Ranch, Dry Fork Canyon has four massive cave systems that a lot of the public go into. There's one we found that very few know. Then coming down north-south, this is the Bottle Hollow Reservoir. If you've seen my other presentation, that uh, anomaly that I caught uh, going back through the history data was that uh, half a mile ripple effect, meaning that there was a cavity system that released some type of gas uh, back in 2000 and I think it was six. So it continues down here. This is Skinwalker Ranch. This is the triangle that I worked on during season two that you saw. There's caves all, uh, oh great, oh, there it goes. Technology, it follows you, right? So you're looking at Skinwalker Ridge where it says the cave right there. And then this south side ground magnetic difference is uh, right on the south adjacent property to Skinwalker Ranch, about three feet away that has the highest magnetic anomalous difference that I've ever seen. It goes all the way down to a negative 14, all the way up to 49 micro Tesla, meaning either that we should be standing in Chile in South America or there's some massive magnet underground or something magnetic and it's not magnetite because I've taken samples. So these caverns are nearly at the same line of latitude as Blind Frog Ranch within the Uinta Mountains. So this one that you're looking at here is Pole Creek Cavern. Again the entrance. Inside the caverns, you can travel in several directions underground. Massive cavern system in multiple directions. Goes deeper and deeper and deeper. They have massive chambers. Oh, by the way, who, who watches uh, Secret of Skinwalker Ranch? Raise your hands. That's Tom Winterton next to me. This section had 12 to 15 foot ceilings. So now we find ourselves about 0.4 miles below ground when we reached this. This is the beginning of an underwater sump, S-U-M-P. It's a large submerged underground domain, approximately 1,000 to 1,400 feet long. That's 0.27 miles long, full of water. It's an underground lake. Then on the other side, it enters more caverns. So two divers only. Well, I'm sure the Native Americans have been way in there, but only two divers have gone to the next cavern. And they stopped there when they saw the next collection of water was even larger than this one. So remember to consider long lengths of underground caverns with past connectivity. Now back to Blind Frog Ranch. So I took soil and rock samples from BFR, Blind Frog Ranch, I may say BFR sometimes, that's what it means. Then I analyzed them later with an XRF gun. This is how an XRF analyzer works. 
It's taking micro x-rays causing the sample to emit fluorescent x-rays and each element reacts by releasing a unique fluorescent fingerprint. It uses a linear absorption coefficient in the calculations. Some samples were solid, others I had pulverized before taking. And before using it, I used Alcoa samples to calibrate the processor. Um, a lot of times, if you watch uh, a show or something, if they are not calibrating it before they take the samples, it's not worth keeping the data. Iridium. Iridium is one of the nine least abundant stable elements in Earth's crust. It has an average mass fraction of one thousandth part per million in crustal rock. That's .001, one thousandth part per million. Platinum is ten times more abundant. Gold is forty times more abundant. Silver and mercury are eighty times more abundant. Yet I got consistent readings of 10 to 60 parts per million on parts of Blind Frog Ranch. Well, guess where iridium is most abundant? Asteroids and meteors. As a matter of fact, I'm always curious. Uh, it's the police in me. I can't let anything go. So I called around and found that there were six meteor pieces that have been found uh, around, I believe it's about 100 square mile area that has crashed in Utah. Those only show an average of four and a half to six parts per million iridium. Mine were 10 to 60. Now, if you watched episode one or two of season, I think it was episode one, uh, they open up talking about how much iridium is available that they can mine three and a half million dollars. That's what the assay showed. Three and a half million dollars worth. Mine would have probably, my assay would have probably been about double that. Now this is what I discovered recently at Blind Frog Ranch. It was in extremely poor condition and required cleaning on Duane's part. As a matter of fact, I was getting ready to toss it out because I thought it was a piece of tin before uh, Chris Bartell stopped me. It was in worse uh, so, and I'll just clear, we had already with our thumbs kind of peeled off the layer of dirt that was on it and I put it back down where I located it so that I could show you, but it was in much worse condition originally. Now this is after Duane cleaned it up. It's an 1810 Spanish colonial silver coin. It's a half real. The coin was located below 10.6 inches of dirt a uh, metal detection unit I was using located the coin. So what does this show? It shows Spanish ties to the property. Who was there and what were they doing? Now granted, I believe in 1810 was when the, in September the Mexican Revolution began, but whether it be Spaniards or Mexican people there, what were they doing there? You know, it shows this connectivity that we've been looking for. This was a coin recovery site. A different angle showing the co where the coin was located. I think if I'm right, Dwayne, is that where those drones like slammed up against? Yeah. Flew all the way across the other side. Say, this would have been a good prop for you while you were telling them. <laughs> this was a gold detection uh, unit being used at the time. That detector is specifically set up at 17.8 uh, megahertz to find only gold. Well, it'll detect other uh, metals, but it's specific to that ore. That, anything above 15 up to 61 uh, megahertz, I believe, is best for gold, but that's a, a good frequency setting to have. So I want to move away a little bit from Blind Frog Ranch and in one of my presentations here at Phoenix MUFON, we've discussed this before, but there's new information now. So this is a location in what seems to be the middle of nowhere. It's just over 16 miles east of Skinwalker Ranch, and it's also uh, southeast of Blind Frog Ranch. I've brought this site up before, uh, like I said. The location is a concrete slab on top of the desert floor in the middle of the desert. On it are markings for NASA. Now here's what's interesting. In June when I went back for the first time, it was completely covered up. Somebody brought a truck and 
dumped a ton of rock and sand debris to completely cover it. Unfortunately, the only road out at McCoy Flats is 6.6 .6 miles long, and guess where it stops at? Right here, so there's really no way of forgetting where it's at. So it took me about 40 minutes to clear that with my boots, and that was about it. I couldn't do any more. I was exhausted. Also, that um, cross marking was added. Now, I don't know if somebody just did that or if someone else did it, but uh, a lot of times they'll use that for aerial pinpointing or for satellite pinpointing uh, for verification of location. So Site 413, that's what it's called. You'll see a Site 413 vernal report. You notice how they're stating several years of data were useless, thus making the data completely unavailable. Well, what was that data? So recently, I finally located a NASA CR1137 report from September of 1968. And it wasn't originating out of NASA. That's how come I missed it before. It was out of Kirtland Air Force Base near, uh, what is it, Santa Fe, New Mexico? Or Albuquerque, New Mexico, right around there. Crazy, right? NASA had nothing on this. So it stated that the Vernal 413 location was one of three sites that secretly monitored sonic booms being created by our own planes, including the SR-71 and the XB-70. At that time, they were both top secret back in the 60s. The planes would purposely pass over the site so that it could collect data on sonic booms. So here's a good time to discuss the hunt for the Skinwalker, uh, the book. Throughout the book, we learned that Skinwalker Ranch was also known as the UFO Ranch. Junior Hicks had been investigating large amounts of UFO activity and sightings for decades. Other loca locations, such as Dulce, New Mexico, were discussed in the book, and Bass, again, Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, investigated many other sightings and locations away from the basin. Yet it was this Skinwalker Ranch team that did the investigating. Well, putting a tracking system where NASA put it may have very well been for additional reasons. This location is where I have come across unidentified aerial phenomena at night directly above the site. When I'm on the basin, I stop at this location late at night to monitor what goes on. I've personally seen a small-sized UAP, an orb. Uh, for me, this shows that there may be more to the site, and it almost seems like someone or something else is also monitoring the location. Okay, so remember I told you I was going to show you the 3D ground imaging. This is it. So this is new data that I pulled from last summer of the NASA site. It almost feels like cheating when I use it. I love it. So. The red areas are metal objects, and the blue areas are voids or cavities. The, the uh, metal object at 3.87 meters, which is about 12 feet down, may very well be seismic detectors uh, used to monitor those sonic booms. But why the cavities? So I almost felt that the site was purposely built over the cavities. On the second 3D uh, image, I wanted to show you depth uh, separate of the cavity. So that's on the left, but consider it going down into the ground, and then the bottom is the red, the, the, where the, I believe the seismic detector is. So the 3D imager sometimes makes me feel, like I said, I'm cheating, being able to see what's below ground without digging. Uh, think about what else that this system could look at. So. Ever wonder what's below ground at the Travis Walton site in northern Arizona? Was the UFO there interacting with something below ground, maybe fueling up? Or how about using this system at the supposed crash sites near Corona, New Mexico? It's portable like no other unit. Uh, someone, and I, I almost had somebody take me out of this. Like I told you, I drive a really low-profile Acura, so I can't get anywhere. So if you want to take me to the Travis Walton site, uh, I would absolutely love to see what's underground there. Let's, go. Let's do it. <laughs> so here's where I'm going with the NASA site. We have a flight path 
heading 335.00 degrees through the UFO crash site near Roswell and Corona, New Mexico. We fly over Los Alamos, Dulce, just east of Skinwalker and Blind Frog Ranch. We're in the direct path of that NASA observatory site. Now consider all the petroglyph sites with strange anthropomorphic figures that look otherworldly that surround a flight path at this degree heading. This is a UFO alley. Great spot for NASA to observe stars, right? Consider the nine UFOs Dwayne just told you about. So we have objects that look to be coming down from the sky onto a group of animals. The animals seem to be running away from the object or the event. Now to me, it looks like one object on the right is a meteor or an asteroid comet. But look at the one on the left. It's obviously some type of flying vehicle or technology. And one last thing about the rock art that's extremely important and almost always overlooked. Why are common subject matter missing in the rock art on or around this part of Utah? Whole broad categories are missing. You see very little, next to nothing, about pottery, cooking utensils, hand tools, dwellings, food, blankets, or musical instruments. No harvest scenes, and most importantly, no maize, no corn scenes, nothing. Why are the things that were most important to these groups missing? What was going on to cause this? What was so important and strange taking their place in this documented history? And I'm surprised more people don't ask that question. This is a one-off I had to show you. The newspaper article was out of the Uinta County on the 10 of July, 1947. That's three days after the Roswell crash and Corona crash. Again, UFO Alley from the beginning of modern UFO history. The sighting was part of over a thousand sightings that took place within several weeks of the summer of 1947. Now this was Asel Raleigh on the left. He was a trapper for the Utah Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now when I was in Vernal, I was eating at my favorite breakfast place, which sadly burned down when I was there for Phenomicon in September. And I hope it's, Charlie Duane, is it built back finally? Oh, thank God, I hope it's ready when I'm there. Anyway, I met one of his relatives. And the relative told me about cattle mutilations in the area that Raleigh investigated them with, with Sheriff Arden Stewart, which is seen on the right side photo. So I did locate newspaper articles from the 1960s all the way up until October of 1975 where Raleigh Stewart or both investigated cattle mutilations. I always tell people when they start talking about cattle mutilations, I understand them, but I don't know a whole lot about them. I'm not really interested in it. What I was interested in is that Raleigh was an animal trapper and a damn good one at that. This meant he knew his way around the basin in the Uinta Mountains, and I was counting on that when I began a deep dive into his past. I was looking for one thing, and guess what? Found it. I'm gonna give you all about half a minute just to look that over while I grab some water. Please read through it. This location is just north of Blind Frog Ranch. It's additional confirmation of caves, sinkholes, and one fine specimen of gold. It's another data point for what may be below ground. The location, I believe, is 1.64 miles northeast of uh, the northeast quadrant of Blind Frog Ranch. Now what are we looking at here? It's a 4.25 pound bar of gold bullion that was discovered by a construction worker that was digging in Mexico City. It was dropped and lost by Hernan Cortez's men on the 30th of June 1520 as they fled from Tenochtitlan. 
Now, many archaeologists state that the Aztec treasure was small and that Mexico really had very little gold, that the Aztec never had a huge abundance to begin with. They're wrong. Not all the gold that the Aztecs had came from Mesoamerica. They had enough gold that when the conquistadors were slaughtered during their retreat, their weighted down bodies sunk to the bottom of the aqueducts that surrounded Tenochtitlan because they were too greedy to leave the gold behind when fleeing. The Aztecs had to get this gold from elsewhere. According to Native Americans in the United States, guess where it was? It was here in the Southwest. I'm a firm believer that the Aztecs most likely originated from northeastern Utah, slowly working their way southward into Mexico and incorporating many different bands and tribes of Native Americans into their migration southward. Remember how I told you earlier, this is what I did in college. The Hohokam that disappeared, guess what? They headed downward with them. Many anthropologists believe the gold was still located at the bottom of the waters surrounding Tenochtitlan. Others state it was hidden in northern Mexico. But when you follow the oral tradition stories originated from the Aztecs, who are, the Aztecs, they didn't know themselves of that. They're known as the Culoa Mexico, that lived during this conquest time then later, the Nahua people of Mexico, they stated that it was very likely that these large caches of gold were broken up into seven caches and deposited in locations from north central Mexico all the way up to Utah, which is where the Aztec ancestral lands are. The largest cache would have been secured at Karshanab, returning the gold from whence it came. So there's a Nahuatl word, it's Teowatl. Remember that the Aztecs spoke Nahuatl. The Ute, Shoshone, and other Utah Territory Indians speak a native dialect of the Numic branch of the Uto Aztecan language family. Teowatl translates to sacred tree and God. In Nahuas mythology, Teowut is known as the creator and the God finger, figure. Towats is the sacred god of the indigenous people located in northeastern Utah. Both words seem to be related, one a derivative of the other. These Nahuatl terms and usage can be seen in the Vindolanesis Codex of the Mesoamerican people. In this codex, the letter T is sacred. So are words beginning with the letter T. This included the Maya, the Aztec, and whoever occupied Teotihuacan, which were giants, by the way, the Kinametzen. And then don't forget Towats, the god. Ta Muan Khan is the original land of humankind. This is where the Nahua are from. The Aztec claim they are descendants from here. The Aztecs will also sometimes refer to the origin land as Aztlan. The Ute and Utah Territory Indians have ties to these Mesoamerican groups. Could Ta Muan Khan be Kershanab? And now it gets even crazier. Kershanab is actually Kerig Shanab. It's ancient Gaelic and Hebrew. So remember, Gaelic is ancient Welsh, Gaelic is the Irish. So, what were the ancient Welsh and Canaanites doing in the Utah Territory a thousand years ago or even earlier than that? Both Tamawan Khan and Ker Shanab are supposedly situated on top of a mountain north of Mesoamerica. The ancestors, gods, and leaders are buried there. Civilization started there. Or was it where man survived a catastrophic event and emerged back into the shiny world from the underworld? Origin is below ground for both. So I spoke to an elderly Nahua in Mexico. Her name was Maria Jurado. She told me that the Utah Indians are senilestli in Nahuatl, meaning family. She stated that I search for, what I'm searching for is Tec Aliahuetl, meaning stone house of God, that the white man only wants the Teocuitlatl, or gold. Now when I asked her if I would find an underground world that contained history of old, she turned away from me. I struck a nerve. That was it. She wouldn't talk to me anymore. Chris Bartell, again, who worked for Bass on Skinwalker Ranch, he and I were on Blind Frog Ranch, and we had this unusual feeling around this tree that you're looking at. 
uh, we both felt like we were being watched. Now, Dwayne was talking about lightning strikes. It's right to the left of this tree on the, the mountain, right? A lot of strikes. You'll see the, the black residue from where it hits all the time. So we both felt like we were being watched. The air seemed energized. And it happened if, I think every time we went back up there, it was the same feeling. So Chris and I took multiple photos of the tree. Now, t two months went by, and out of nowhere, Chris Bartell calls me up, and he was like, hey, dude, I had this, just this thought about doing something. He, play, it, he cut the image in half, flipped it, and mirror imaged it, which is what? It's the equivalent of adding additional dimensions to a photo. This is what adding dimension did. There's the sacred tea, a sacred tree, and what likes to be the face of maybe creator. So I've thought about this photo for some time. Something was calling out to be seen, even experienced. So it got me to thinking. Maybe manipulating the photo was a way of mimicking what would have we would have experienced through ritual or ceremony by fasting, meditation, and altering frequencies with use of song and musical instruments. Or what if altering perceptions with certain narcotics also produced this effect? Think ayahuasca or DMT. Does communicating with other entities require us to alter our perception, change how we perceive what is around us, opening other realms or higher dimensions to start seeing what the Native Americans can clearly see. Another thing about this tree, well, am I allowed to talk about the whirlwind? The, okay. That's okay, okay. This tree in February of 2021, I wasn't there. There was a large group of people, they were videotaping. Out of this tree, not behind it, not in front of it, not a, I, it was almost like a tornado or a large dust devil or dirt devil, whatever they're called, huge, came up out of the tree, went across the creek, and literally attacked another tree that had this shrine built around it in stone. A lot of time, the, the way the, mark, the markings are is how the Spaniards would mark treasure around a tree. Uh, unfortunately, by the time I got there, somebody had messed with it and dug it up. Dwayne did, I, that was when we found it. The first time we located, somebody had dug it up. But it attacked the other tree, and it lasted for, for a while trying to rip it out of the ground. So the energy that occurs is incredible. Now, one of the long, oh, I'm just apologize. Go back. One of the long caves goes inward, approximately 25 feet before heading downward, deeper into the mountain. It goes toward and down below. Guess what tree? This is the entrance of the cave being discussed. So I considered crawling into the cave for all of about two seconds. It went way back, would have had to be crawling head first, and then I remembered the two wolves known to be on the property, the coyote I had seen earlier, the mountain lion that I heard roar, and the bear scat that Chris and I had just run into earlier. So that was a no. Uh, this is that bear scat, by the way, so you know I'm not lying. Here's another cave entrance. Remember that any one of these entrances could go deep underground and open to a massive unexplored cavern system. What's great is what Dave was telling you. I'm on the morning podcast. We discussed the, the episode from the night before. And I told them there's no way in hell I'm going in there. And Chad Ollinger was like, I'm, I'm good. He, he'll head right in. He don't care. So this is a mine we ventured into that's in the Uintah Mountains, a few miles away from Blind Frog Ranch. There were still large quartz veins running throughout that had not been picked at to check and see if gold was contained within the quartz. And guess what 
only tool I had, the 3D ground imager. Nothing that could look into the, break down those quartz veins. Guess where I'll be back? This is a mine that was 88 feet of tunnel. Uh, it's, the miners stopped mining it when the owner blew himself up with dynamite in 1986. Gold fever. Now remember one of the tools that I showed you earlier, the Stalker ATR stationary KA band radar gun? You didn't want to be on the other end of it when I was a cop, right? Operates at 34.7 gigahertz. I think it's a 0.86 centimeter spectrum if I remember in width. It caused this unidentified aerial phenomena to attempt evasion of the microwaves. This continued for 92 seconds. So I, I can't show you the video. It'll be appearing at some point in some other show. Uh, but I am showing you some stills. I promise you it was not a drone, because I was within 200 feet of it. Um, it wasn't just light, because the signal bounced back clocked speeds of 11 to 44 miles per hour, meaning the object had surface area that microwave radiation contacted, was able to bounce back a signal. So you got to think out of the box. If I would just taken videos and photos, everybody would have said it was photoshopped. So it's just new ways of providing data points for what's happening. Now there are some finds that I question if they're legitimate or placed there in order to purposely contaminate the television show or research into who was there before us and what was uh, you know, taking place. Those are European treasure location symbols. I'm just not sure. I believe it was put there in 1731. Uh, the way that the numbers are written do not match how numbers were written at the time period. Of course, that being said, it's a rudimentary carving, so maybe it was just because it was carved into stone. But this is on the property. So interesting about the past carving or the fact that some Native Americans stated that uh, they were being enslaved by the Spaniards to dig for and process gold in the 16th and 17th century is officially the Spanish were not in the Uinta territory until 1776 with the Dominguez Escalante expedition. This is on file in both Santa Fe and Mexico City, but this was BS. The Spaniards did not, did not want the rest of the world to know that Utah had vast riches of precious ores. They also did not want anyone to know about Kershanab, so they could continue searching for it without having to keep others away. It wasn't until the white trappers and fur traders began consistently running into the Spaniards that they had to send a legitimate expedition up into the southwest and uh, state that this was their first time documenting the territory. The expedition eventually became uh, the early template for the old Spanish trail leading to California, but there was always ulterior motive for the expedition. Here's another interesting piece of information coming from oral tradition of the Native Americans in Utah and partially backed up by how long the party spent around the Utah mountains and how interested they were in the real Utah Indians, which were the Timpanogos. Again, not the Ute, which were located in the Colorado Territory, and didn't move completely into Utah until they were forced to do so by the American government and occupy the Ute Reservation, which is really made up of multiple tribes of Native Americans, not just the Ute. The expedition was a front. The Spanish government out of Mexico City wanted Santa Fe leaders to locate a supposed city of gold in the Southwest or at least the place where all the gold was coming from to create a golden city and supply the Aztec with most of their gold since so little was naturally found in Mexico. The Spaniards in the expedition took a large interest in the Timpanogos tribe of the Indians. The Timpanogos were those groups of Shoshone that had lived in the Utah Territory for a very long time, most likely being ones with the greatest ties to Mesoamerica and the Aztec and Toltec more specifically. So what we all thought was important uh, to what was going on at Skinwalker Ranch and the basin were the Ute and the Navajo connection, uh, especially the curse of the Skinwalker, the Yinablushi. 
Turns out the Ute have little to do with the distant ancient history in the Uinta Mountains and Basins. So we need to start focusing instead on the Shoshone, uh, specifically the Timpanogos tribe, the snake bands. These Indians were mistaken for the Ute because of the similarity with the word Utah. Remember that the Ute are not originally from Utah. The others are Utah Territory Native Americans. So the Timpanogos were forced to live on what became known as the Ute Reservation. They've been absorbed by this larger culture and forgotten about as a separate people. Now this is one of two smelters found below Mosby Creek. Uh, this specific one is located on Crow Creek on the left. Uh, remember that Crow Creek? Guess where it runs right through? Cuts Dwayne's property up right down the middle. And this is another smelter uh, located a couple miles east of Crow Creek, meaning just east of Blind Frog Ranch. This is supposedly a map leading to Kershanab. The map was apparently created in the late 1800s by Aaron Daniels, a devout Mormon. Daniels did have many friends in the area, including the Rhodes family. And remember that Kershanab in the Mormon mine is most often known as the Rhodes mine and they have, have direct ties together. Now for years I've been attempting to match this map to locations in the Uinta Mountains and for the first time I have three solid leads which will be followed up with this June. I'm just hoping that I don't become uh, another statistic for David Polites. This arrow was carved into a tree north of Blind Frog Ranch. I, from looking at it, I, I don't think it was more than 100 years old, but it's still um, a treasure-seeking symbol that's used quite a bit. So the high Uintas were extensively glaciated during the last ice age, and most of the large stream valleys on both the north and south sides of the range held long valley glaciers. However, Despite reaching to over 13,500 feet in elevation, the climate today is sufficiently dry that no glaciers survived, even before the rapid current glacial retreat began in the middle 19th century. The Uintas are the most poleward mountain range in the world to reach over 13,000 feet without modern glaciers, and are in fact the highest mountain range in the contiguous United States with no modern glaciers. Permafrost does occur at elevations above 10,000 feet, so at times you'll have uh, rock glaciers form, but not at a large scale. They are also the only east-west trending mountain range in the Rocky Mountain system. And remember, that's trending, so there are some parts that may be facing north-south. These are some more data points required to solve the puzzle. The Uintah Mountains and the basin are full of mystery and wonders, some still needing to be solved. So with it, I know will come some other answers, especially as we continue on at Blind Frog Ranch and Skinwalker Ranch. Here's another view of the area. Here, Tom Winterton from the show The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch was kind enough to take Chris Bartell and I up into the High Uintas. Uh, this was in search of underground cavern systems so that connections throughout the basin and mountains could later be made with the data points collected. Now, this rendition was made by Clifford Mahoudi, and I talked to him a couple weeks ago. He was going to be here. Um, unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, he allowed me to use this in his presentation. He gave it here at uh, Phoenix MUFON. It's what he believed an ancient Native American site looked like in the past. When I saw this, it completely caught my eye because of something that I had been investigating with Chris for the past nine months. So when glaciers receded, formations that looked like this could be created. It was caused by rocks trapped in the ice, guess what, being deposited over a cavity or a sinkhole and building up over time. Notice that this formation is approximately a quarter mile in diameter. It's at just over 11,000 feet at the top center. The USGS aeromagnetic map states it's a mesa. In person, it looks completely out of place. 
And the funny thing that we just discussed a few moments ago, glaciers weren't located at this range. So what the hell is it doing here? It matches an oral tradition story that I heard about recently that is why this is one of those three locations that we'll be investigating in June. There is an increase of 235 feet from base of formation to top center. Natural or man-made, it doesn't matter. My interest is what lies beneath it. Here's another point of interest on Blind Frog Ranch. Looks completely out of place. I was unable to use my equipment at this location because of the positioning of the stones. They are large and heavy, creating blockage to what is behind. Just looks way out of place. So several categories of repeating unexplainable phenomena in northeastern Utah are occurring. One is disrupting electronics and technology. It's a big one. Two, underground voids, cavities, or caverns. Three, Native American connection. Four, a felt presence. Non-human intelligence are attempting to communicate with us. Think toe watts on Blind Frog Ranch and what's in the air above the triangle at Skinwalker Ranch. Other dimension, well, number five, other dimensions or interdimensional connection. The sacred tree area at Blind Frog Ranch and above the triangle at Skinwalker Ranch or at Homestead 2 at Skinwalker Ranch. Blind Frog Ranch has a lot of history, not just what Dwayne and the show Mystery at Blind Frog Ranch have shown us and discussed. The history is thousands of years old in the making and must include a laundry list of cultures, civilizations, and quite possibly other life forms. I always like showing this too. Dwayne likes to send me into the places that he doesn't like going, <laughs> right? He's just standing there. He's, he's still talking. He's like, no, you need to go deeper, further, go in more. <laughs> Over the last two years, I've been collecting new information, history and data points on BFR and the Uinta Basin and the mountains. My hypothesis on what is going on and causes for some of the unexplainable has changed several times. This is because of the ongoing findings and the new data points. I'm really focused in on what is below ground. And these people of large stature that continue to look to be origin for so much of what is questioned or currently not understood. Again, I apologize, getting into the giants and the history that I've collected would be another presentation. So I'll continue to update everyone with findings on the history of the area and the findings below ground. I'll continue to search for this Tamuan Khan, or Kershanab as most know it. I firmly believe that much of our past will be shown to us in artifacts, documents, and other objects that this location most likely contains. I'll keep you informed on progress at findings out who or what uh, the skinwalkers are on the Uinta Basin. I firmly believe that they are a secret society of Native Americans using the Navajo lore to scare away those in search of answers. So again, this summer, myself and several others have a planned expedition up to the mountains. I just confirmed it with Dwayne, thank you. Uh, we'll be conducting the physical searches uh, in the underground locations and collecting the data points on unexplainable phenomena at those sites and I will make it as public as I possibly can. Thank you, I appreciate your time.